Hello and welcome to Upper Gastrointestinal Bleed in the Specialist Area Emergency. Let's start off with what you already know. Question 1. What is the most common cause of an upper GI bleed? Is it A. Mallory Weiss syndrome, B. esophagitis, C. peptic ulcer, or D. duodenal ulcer? The answer is C. peptic ulcer. Peptic ulcer makes up 35 to 50% of the causes of upper GI bleed. Duodenal ulcers 8 to 15%, Mallory Weiss syndrome 15%, and esophagitis 5 to 15%. Question 2. What drug can cause peptic ulcer? A. Aspirin, B. Bisoprolol, C. Amoxicillin, or D. Paracetamol? The answer is A, aspirin. Aspirin is a COX inhibitor. Within certain pathways, the COX inhibitors prevent prostaglandin from being released. And prostaglandin indirectly is associated with the release of bicarbonate ions. And the bicarbonate ions are responsible for neutralizing the acid in the stomach. Question three. In the emergency setting, you have an unconscious patient. How do you begin your assessment of the patient? Is it A, GI examination, B, A, B, C, D, E, C, endoscopy, or D, brief history? The answer is B, A, B, C, D, E. Your patient is unconscious, so you will be unable to take a brief history off of them. However, if they were conscious, do take a brief history as this will give you a guide as to where you would want to look for the cause of the problem. So the objectives of this talk is we'll be talking about what is an upper GI bleed, history and examinations, the acute management, investigations, differential diagnosis and prognosis, and OSCE tips, and a few questions at the end to test your knowledge. Let's start with what is an upper GI bleed. The definition of an upper GI bleed is that it is a hemorrhage arising from the upper part of the GI tract, i.e. proximal to the ligament of trites. Some of the causes of an upper GI bleed are H. pylori, NSAIDs and steroids. These are causes that can lead to peptic ulcer. If you look at this picture that I've supplied, you have a suspensory muscle of duodenum, also known as the ligament of trites. So anywhere beyond that will be considered lower GI, but anywhere above that, it will be considered upper. For your assessment, if the patient is conscious, take a brief history and examination to assess the severity. But if they're unconscious, you'd want to proceed with an ABCDE assessment to try and resuscitate, resuscitate them before they deteriorate. In the history, you'd want to ask about the past medical history. Some of the things you might want to ask about if they've ever had a GI bleed before. Do they suffer from dyspepsia? Do they have recurrent vomiting, chronic liver disease? Have they suffered from dysphagia, anorexia, or weight loss? These will all indicate their cause. For the medication history, ask specifically about one of the six. NSAIDs, aspirin, clopidogrel, bisphosphonates, anticoagulants, tricyclic antidepressants. And for their social history, ask if they are smokers or about their alcohol consumption, as the alcohol consumption can sometimes indicate their, if they have a liver disease. Now, for the examination, you want to want to assess their vomiting. You want to see what it looks like. So, is it fresh blood? Hematemesis, are they vomiting it? So is it an, it would indicate an active UGI bleed. What about if it's coffee ground vomiting? The bleeding may be less profuse. Do they have melina or hematochezia? Hematochezia is usually due to lower GI bleed. However, it may occur where an upper tract hemorrhage is profuse or particularly brisk. This is known as a rapid transit. Do they have postural hypertension? Do they feel dizzy? Have they collapsed? 
and look for signs of chronic liver disease such as leukonychiae, palmarothema, spider nevi, dupuytren's contractor, ascites or jaundice. Please note that I've only named a few of the signs of chronic liver disease. There are other signs of chronic liver disease such as raised JVP. If you're going to be doing a PR examination, check for melina. And if this patient is suffering due to cool and clammy, are they drowsy, tachycardic, hypotensive, postural drop in blood pressure, poor urine output, this could indicate that they may be shocked. You'd want to assess how much blood they were losing. So using your vital signs such as blood pressure, pulse, assessing their mental state and respiratory rate, you'll be able to classify how much blood they're losing. For example, if their blood pressure is unchanged, they're slightly tachycardic, they're alert, and their respirator is normal. This would indicate that they're losing less than 15% of blood, so less than 750 milliliters. However, if their blood pressure is very low systolic, very low or unrecordable diastolic, greater than 120 pulse, they're drowsy, confused, or unconscious, and their respiratory rate is above 20, they could be losing more than 40%, i.e. more than 2,000 milliliters. So they're classified as class 4. How would you acutely manage this patient? So you'd always begin with an ABCD assessment in any emergency situation. So A stands for airway. Is it patent? Would you need to apply suction or intubation? B, their respirate and their pulse oximetry. Supply them with 15 liters per minute of oxygen through a non-rebreather mask. Their circulation. How's their blood pressure, their heart rate, their cap refill, and auscultate their heart as well. Insert a cannula, add three lead cardiac monitoring, Take bloods at the same time, send it off for FBCs, uni, LFT, clotting profile, lactate, and also for a cross match, that way you can get the blood that the blood requirement that they need. Do a VBG. Insert a urinary catheter because when you supply them with fluids, you would not want them to be overloaded. And IV colloid, it's a type of fluid resuscitation. Example hemocele and supply them with 500 to 1,000 milliliters until cross-matched blood arrives. But if you are in an emergency, give them o rhesus negative blood. And D stands for disability. Check their glucose, their temperature, GCS, perla and pain. You might want to give them analgesia and correct the glucose. If their temperature is raised, this could indicate an infection. And PERLA would indicate neurological compromise. E, expose the patient. You may find other abnormalities that they may have, such as, um, for example, in a trauma scenario, they may be stabbed, or it, they may have other, they may be having PR bleeds. So manage any abnormal findings and note them down. After doing your ABCDE assessment, you would want to notify the senior and surgeons to get them involved as early as possible so that way the prognosis of the patient doesn't get worse. Transfuse until hemodynamically stable. Correct clotting abnormalities. Monitor their pulse, blood pressure, and CVP at least hourly until stable. If they're shocked, monitor the urine output hourly. And in high-risk patients, organize chest X-ray, ECG, and ABG and arrange an urgent endoscopy. Now, during your ABCD assessment, you would have sent things off for investigation. Some of the things you would have done was bloods. You would have sent them off for a chest X-ray, an ECG, an endoscopy, and you may need to do a CT angiography. They may have a perforated duodenal ulcer, and this the CT angi angiography would be perfect for picking it up. Some of the differential diagnosis that you'd want running through your mind, such as peptic ulcer, gastric and duodenal ulcers, Mallory-Weiss syndrome, esoph perforated esophageal varices, upper GI malignancy, epistaxis and drugs. So, epistaxis is the nosebleed, so make sure that you are checking as well that if they're having a nosebleed, 
because it may not be nothing wrong with their GI tract, but the epistaxis could mimic that they're having an upper GI bleed. So for the prognosis, you have two scoring systems, one called Rockel score and the other one called the Glasgow Blatchford score. The difference between the two is that the Glasgow Blatchford score requires blood urea, hemoglobin, blood pressure, and other requirements such as tachycardia, melina, syncope, liver failure, and cardiac failure. The Glasgow Blatchford score can be used once the patient has been admitted and does not require anything else except any of those requirements. However, for the Rockel score has five requirements, age, shock, comorbidity, an endoscopic diagnosis, major stigmata of recent hemorrhage. So therefore, the Rockel score requires an endoscopy in order to assess the severity of the bleed. That's the difference between the two. Some OSCE tips about emergency settings. If the patient is conscious, try and take a brief history and examination to try and assess the severity of this patient. And if they're unconscious, always start with ABDC, ABCDE assessment. So let's review what we have taught, been taught with some questions. So a 52-year-old male came to A&E with hematemesis. He has a past medical history of MI. He is on aspirin, statin, bisoprolol, and allopurinol. What drug do you suspect is causing his hematemesis? Is it A, aspirin, B, statin, C, bisoprolol, or D, allopurinol? The answer is aspirin, because again, it's a COX inhibitor. What scoring system requires endoscopy for assessing a UGI bleed? Is it A, CURB-65, B, Glasgow Blatchford, C, Wells, or D, Rockle? The answer is D, Rockle score. Question three. In the emergency setting, how do you begin your assessment of a conscious patient? Take a brief history, do an endoscopy, and a GI examination, or ABCDE. Take a brief history to assess the severity of the patient. Thank you very much for your time.